Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Sung Hun Lee from International Christian University. And uh, today we have uh, the practical workshop uh, on about uh, syntax prosody in optimality theory uh, and OT workshop, workplace. Uh, today we will have spot workshop and tomorrow morning we will have OT workplace uh, workshop. Both uh, that are, both have a lecture component followed by uh, exercise component. Uh, today's uh, workshop is co-organized with uh, Haruo Kubozono and Ninja and myself. And the events are sponsored by ICU Linguistic Lab, Ninja Collaborative Research Project, Cross Linguistic Studies of Japanese Prosody and Grammar, the Phonological Society of Japan, and the Phonetic Society of Japan. I also want you to know that the assistants of today's group uh, uh, all have a shared background, so you can see who they are. And uh, we have uh, two assistants, Richard Suzuki and Paris Fleming from ICU, and three assistants, uh, Richard Bibbs, Nick Van Handel, and Ed Schingler from UC Santa Cruz. Okay, uh, let me introduce today's uh, uh, speaker, uh, Jenny Bellick. Uh, Jenny uh, is a postdoctoral researcher of linguistics at the University of California, Santa Cruz, where she received her PhD in 2019. Her research interests are in optimality theory, the syntax prosody interface, articulative phonology, and uh, several languages, but including, uh, but not limited to Turkish. So let's welcome Jenny. You can share your screen. Yeah. All right. Hello, everyone. Yes. All right. I, hopefully, the audio is all good. So, yes, audio is good. And uh, uh, those who are not presenting maybe uh, can uh, stop their videos uh, during the presentation. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Thank so, Thank let's, uh, let's begin the spot tutorial. So, first, uh, a little bit about the spot project um, syntax prosody in optimality theory or spot is a collaborative research project in the linguistics department at the University of California, Santa Cruz. And we're aiming to develop tools for rigorously investigating the mapping from syntactic structure to prosodic structure. And as of fall 2018, this work is funded by the NSF uh, with a grant to the principal investigators, Junko Ito and Armin Mester. And I'd like to acknowledge all the other um, members of the SPOT team. So uh, another postdoctoral researcher, Nick Calavota, um, and our software engineering consultant um, architect, Ozan Bellick, graduate research assistants, Richard Bibbs, Nick Van Handel, Netta Van Meer, um, Dan Bronken, and Ben Eichens, and um, a number of excellent undergraduate research assistants. Um, and so three of those uh, team members are joining us today to help with the, the practice session. All right, so the SPOT group is developing an open source application, the SPOT app, which automates candidate generation and constraint evaluation over prosodic parses for work in the theoretical framework of optimality theory. And you can access everything from the SPOT website, spot.sites.ucsc.edu. Um, there's links there to the, the app, which is hosted on my website and also the code base, which is hosted on GitHub. So before we talk about the, the app itself, I want to give a little background about the kind of the framework. So by talking about systems in optimality theory. So I'm sure you're all familiar with optimality theory, OT. It's a theoretical framework whose central concept is the notion of optimality. Um, and an optimal candidate is one that performs better than all relevant competitors. So better performance is determined by the candidate set, so con sorry, the constraint set con, um, and the relevant competitors uh, is defined by the candidate set or gen. Now, typically OT papers will pay more attention to defining the, uh, the constraint set than the candidate set. So they focus more on con rather than gen. Um, and oftentimes papers don't specify all the possible candidates. But this gets to be problematic because when candidates are omitted, this can invalidate the final analysis. So if you leave out a candidate that actually performs better than your intended optimum, uh, the argument will fail um, when you add that missing candidate back in. Um, as you can, there's a couple uh, papers about this if you want to uh, get more details. So uh, because of this, a valid analysis in OT needs to formally define both the constraint set and the candidate set. Um, and that is to say, they need to define the OT system being studied. So an OT system, let's call it S, 
consist of s.gen, that's the set of input and output candidates. Um, ideally, they should be algorithmically defined. And s.con, which is the set of constraints in s. And for more information on systems, you can see um, some uh, various works by Alan Prince, such as the OT checklist and the slide deck, what is OT, which are linked. Um, I will share this handout uh, afterwards. All right, so the SPOT app provides support for defining an OT system for an analysis of syntax prosody mapping, um, as well as support for actually generating and evaluating the candidates for the system. So let's talk about what those candidates are in the domain of syntax prosody mapping. So in the view of syntax prosody mapping assumed by SPOT, inputs are syntactic trees or S trees consisting of um, syntactic heads, X zeros, uh, phrases, XP, and clauses, CP. And then the outputs are prosodic trees, P trees, consisting of uh, prosodic words, omega, phonological phrases, phi, and intonational phrases, I, uh, iota. The candidates are S tree, P tree pairs. Um, so Spot assumes this prosodic hierarchy shown in one, right? So the intonational phrase is over the phonological phrase, which is over the prosodic word. And those three are the interface categories, and they're the default categories in the in spots gen, although we also have support for these rhythmic categories, the foot and syllable. Um, and uh, please note that the spot uses the curly braces for intonational phrases and the round parentheses for phi boundaries. So you'll see those in the, the output candidates in spot later on. Um, so Using this prosodic hierarchy and uh, allowing just one recursive category gives us trees um, approximately like this. Uh, so this is the this is a picture of the eight possible trees rooted in the iota with non-root non-terminal nodes being phi's and having um, two phonological uh, word terminals um, that are labeled x and y. So we can have some trees like this one that conform to strict layering, right? So we have an intonational phrase and then the words are all parsed into phonological phrases before going up into the intonational phrase. Um, or this one also conforms to strict layering, um, but also trees where there's some non-exhaustive parsing, like the phonological word being parsed directly into the intonational phrase, skipping the phi level. This is the same one, except uh, mirrored. Um, here's one that doesn't have any phi's at all. So that's, that's probably bad if you don't, unless you want to uh, admit headless candidates. Uh, and then these three also violate strict layering because they allow, they have uh, phonological recursion. So there's phi's that contain other phi's. Um, so you can see if you uh, allow truly weak layering, then we can get a lot of different parses, even for just two terminals. And that leads into the, the main reason for spot. Uh, because candidates in syntax prosody mapping are pairs of trees, even a really strict gen function will give you an approximately exponential increase in the number of output structures as the number of words in the sentence grows. So this is depicted in the graph here in three. Uh, note that the y-axis has a logarithmic scale. So uh, these, so it's it's increasing by a, a factor of, of 10 for each vertical increment. Yeah, so if we look at the green line, this shows us the strict layering gen. So if we wanted to say every word needs to be parsed into a phi and then the phi's cannot be recursive, um, then you can have 32 ways of dividing five words into phonological phrases and then wrapping all the phonological phrases into an intonational phrase. So that's not such a huge number, um, but if we admit uh, recursive structures and non-exhaustive parses like these guys, then um, now we have uh, 2,880 ways to build a tree rooted in iota with five words as the terminals and all the non-root non-terminals being phi's. Right, so scaling these up to uh, five terminals, you get almost 3,000 parses for just five words. So uh, most of those output structures will ultimately be harmonically bounded, so they won't be possible optima under any ranking of the constraints. Uh, but it's impossible to know in advance which ones will be harmonically bounded and which ones are possible optima that you 
may or may not have actually wanted. So to be sure of having a complete analysis, they all need to be considered. Um, these huge numbers of candidates are the primary motivation for automating um, an OT analysis of the of syntax prosody mapping. Uh, so this is where a spot comes in. Um, uh, obviously, it's impractical to build and evaluate all of those prosodic trees by hand, um, and it's also impossible to do this automatically using OT Workplace or other existing OT software because their candidate generation capacity is limited to regular expressions, which cannot handle recursion. Um, so Spot, on the other hand, was designed specifically to handle tree structures, and it produces violation tableau that you can view in the browser or you can download them and then import them into another OT tool such as OT Workplace for further analysis. Uh, in today's session, well, I'll demonstrate primarily how to build the system in Spot and a little bit of how to bring that into OT Workplace. And then tomorrow we'll focus on the uh, typological analysis in OT Workplace. Although the Spot uh, violation tableau can also be imported into other tools um, like OT Soft. All right, so uh, today we're going to build a simplified version of a system that analyzes syntax prosody matches and mismatches that's inspired by phrasing data from Japanese. So we'll, we're going to ignore accents but, and just look at the larger phrasing. We'll call this system uh, match syntax to prosody, align syntax to prosody, so for short, uh, MSP, ASP. And this is the system that was the focus of the background reading um, by um, uh, Junko Ito and Kalavoda and Armin Mustard. That's uh, two up here. So you can also download, if you haven't looked at that, that's also in the um, drive link, I believe. Uh, and then in the practice session after this lecture, we'll demonstrate in the breakout rooms how to use some additional features of Spot. All right, so now let's see how to actually use the Spot app by defining and building the system MSP ASP. So step zero, we could say, is getting to the Spot interface. Um, so the easiest way to do that, if you don't already have it open, is to navigate to uh, spot.sites.ucsc.edu, and you'll see a website like this. And then uh, there's a link to the web app uh, at the top of the page, and it's also at the bottom of the page everywhere. Um, the link to the code base is there too. This one is for GitHub. But what we want is the web app, so you can click on the spot web app link and then you should arrive at spot like this. Um, if you wanna have local access to the code, you can download it from, um, from GitHub. There's some instructions about that in the, in the readme uh, if you wanna be able to use spot um, when you're offline. All right, so the first, uh, oh, let me say about the built-in system. So when you get to the interface, you can see there's this, the first thing uh, on there is this built-in systems bit. And you can, this is a place where you can pick one of these systems from the drop-down menu and then see the trees and um, gen settings and constraints and so on for uh, systems uh, that are for papers that are published in the existing literature. So then you can use the get results button and kind of see the um, see the violation tableau for those. Uh, but what we wanna to do today is to define our own system. So for that, we need to uh, skip over the built-in systems and start thinking about the inputs. Um, so let's think about what the system is before we try to do it on spot. The inputs to MSP ASP will be inspired by data on Japanese phrasing from Kubozono 1989. And these are shown in table one. It's kind of an inspirational data. It's a very abstract representation. Uh, the basic pattern we want to account for is that um, when you take all the possible binary branching syntactic trees, um, there are five of them, and four get a matching prosody, and one gets a mismatched prosody. So if you take the uniformly right branching syntax here, it gets a uniformly right branching prosody. If you take this mixed branching syntax that branches first to the left and then to the right, you get the same shape of prosody, same for the branching right and then branching left here. Um, and if you take a symmetrically branching syntax, you get a symmetrically branching prosody. So those all match. But if you take the left branching syntax, you get a symmetrically branching prosody. So that's a mismatch. 
Um, and this, this, this is an asymmetric pattern, right? So the, the right branching and left branching are mirror images of each other, but they have different behaviors in the prosody. So let's define the set of inputs for our system, um, MSP, ASP, as in four, to include uh, those four, hmm, not scrolling, okay, sorry. The, those five, uh, four terminal trees up here, and then also uh, the two three word syntactic trees. So let's say the inputs to MSP, ASP will be binary branching syntactic trees on terminal strings of three to four nodes. That is gonna be determined by the terminal strings that we specify on spot. Uh, we want the terminal nodes to be syntactic words x0. That's the default um, on spot. So we won't have to set anything special for that. Non-terminal nodes will be syntactic phrases xp. That's also a default setting. Non-branching xps will be treated as x0. So we're gonna leave out, um, we're gonna leave out unary xps. So you can see in these rep syntactic representations, there's no uh, XP that only contains A or an XP that only contains B. So we'll just leave those out. Um, so that's one we'll have to actually set directly on spot. Uh, and finally, the orthographic representation of the bracketing structure will impose a linear order on the leaves. So we're not considering um, things kind of moving around um, in a sort of mobile fashion. The, the, the way we're writing it is supposed to represent the linear order. OK, and that's always true on spot. We don't need to set anything special. All right, so I'm going to demonstrate two ways to build these trees in spot. So first is manually. We'll just building only a universal support for the system. And second is automatically by codifying these uh, parameters on the spot interface and then letting spot actually build the trees. So uh, hmm. what is a? universal support. It's a subset of inputs that generates the same typology as the full set of inputs uh, in gen. So the gen specified in just above here in four defines seven trees. It turns out that if we take just these three trees defined in six, that actually uh, will generate the same typology as using all seven inputs. So these, these trees in the universal support are first the uniformly right branching forward tree, which I'm gonna refer to as 4WR, so forward right branching. Um, a mixed branching tree, which I'm gonna refer to as 4WM, and then the uniformly left branching tree, which I'll call 4WL, forward left branching. Uh, the labels of the words here, they're A, B, C, D. These are arbitrary, but they just need to be distinct from each other. So they each word needs to have a unique identifier. Uh, and we'll give arbitrary labels to the XPs as well for ease of reference. All right, so these, uh, here I've shown the trees with bracket notation, but you can see a more traditional tree view of them right here. Um, so the right branching, the mixed branching, and the left branching. and and if we can scroll down a little bit, uh, those in, in spot, when we build those, they're gonna look a little bit more blocky like this. So again, the right branching, uh, the mixed branching and the left branching. Okay. So let's see how to build those manually in spot. So going over to the spot interface, the first thing we need to do is put in the string of terminals that we want, and that's going to be A, B, C, D. And if I click build syntax, then I should get this little uh, kind of a seed of a tree. So this is the spot, basic uh, spot graphical tree representation. And in this representation, every node has two attributes, a category that's the, with the gray background here, this one is CP. And then with the white background, that's the identifier or the ID. So uh, for nodes to be visible to the syntax prosody mapping constraints, their categories need to be either um, CP like this, or it could be XP or X0. And note those are all lowercase. If you change it to uh, uppercase like that CP or XP uppercase, that is not gonna be visible to the mapping constraints. 
So by default, the root uh, has category CP, but I'm going to change it to XP because we said that the, our inputs are supposed to be rooted in the syntactic phrase um, XP like that. And I'm going to change the ID to, so that it's not confusing. And the ID can be anything um, alphanumeric, just uh, don't put hyphens in it. Right? So if I try to put a, um, an underscore is okay, but if I try to put a hyphen, um, Spot is going to complain and say, that's not okay, no hyphens. Um, and you can look at this little info section that you can view from clicking this info button to uh, get some of this information as well. Uh, so I'm going to take out the hyphen and just uh, have it say XP1. Um, all right. So to let's build this uh, 4WR first. So we fixed the category of the root, and now we need to build this lower XP structure. So let's build the XP contain with uh, containing B, C, and D. So to do that, I'm going to select those three X zeros. So I can do that by uh, hovering over the X zero until it turn gets a gray background, and then click. So then it should turn blue, signaling that it's it's been selected. And I'm going to select the other ones. And now I can click uh, Add Mother to get this um, this XP. So that corresponds to this one or uh, this one XP5 over here. And then we also need the XP that just contains the rightmost two terminals, uh, XP6 in here. So I can get that again by selecting these. So I'm going to hover. Front is gray. I can click and click Add Mother, and it creates another um, XP. So at this point, uh, this structure completely ref looks the same as the one over here, except for some differences in the ID labels. So um, I'm satisfied with that tree, and I can click Done, um, Add Trees to Analysis, and I should this little message pops up saying that they've been it's been added to the analysis, um, and I can see the code, the JavaScript representation of it uh, down here. Um, if you want to verify that things look right. So you can see the code by clicking on this, this little toggle switch. All right, so that's the first tree. Um, now to get another tree, let's build the 4WM now. I'm going to put the same terminal string in here in the, where it says string of terminals and click build syntax. And it gives me the next, the same tree kind of seed shape. All right, so I can go through the same process, change the root category and the root ID. And then now I'm going to build, I'm going to select um, B, C, D again, B, C, D, click Add Mother. I'm having a little latency here. All right. And then um, suppose I then, um, let's, let's see what happens if I, if I uh, add a node that I actually don't want. So say I mistakenly select um, A and then XP5. And, and click Add Mother. And then I realize, oh, wait, that's not the same shape as this tree I was trying to build. Then I can select the, the mistaken XP and then click the Delete button and get rid of it. OK, so the one I actually want is going to have uh, B and C together, Add Mother, and then now that's 4WM. OK, so I'm going to go ahead and build the third uniformly left branching one as well. And it's just the same procedure. I'm going to change the category of the root. And now the other XPs are going to be aligned with the, the left edge. Right, and no, you can, you can drag the corner of this tree builder box to change the size. Um, what happens if I accidentally click um, a and D and try to give those a mother, um, that's impossible. It's impossible to create a valid tree structure where that, that where A and D are, uh, have a mother, but, um, but it doesn't, that mother doesn't also include B and C. So Spot will warn me about that and complain. So I'm going to unselect D and what I actually want is it's to get A and B, um, add mother and now there we go. So that's the uniformly left branching structure. OK, so now that I've made all of those trees, I need to add them all to the analysis. 
Um, I think, okay, there we go. So another message saying that they're added uh, has popped up and we can know that they're there. Oh, Jenny? Yeah? Uh, can is we there make sure that, uh, yeah, no, can we make sure that everyone uh, is uh, following up, up to this point? Uh, so does yeah, anyone have a question uh, at this point? Let me put the link for the handout in the in the chat also. Right, that would be helpful. Yeah. Uh, I think. So Jenny just shared the. Uh, uh, sorry. Uh, yeah. Hmm. Okay. Uh, sorry, I'm having a problem with the. Yes, yes, uh, just, uh, uh, yeah. I will, I can share it later on, yeah, yeah. So, does anyone have a question at this point? Mm. So, it seems like... Uh, uh, Sorry, can oh, I ask uh, a hey, question? Yes, yes, uh, Morimoto-san, hi. 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 <laughs> Um, thank you for the workshop. I wanted to ask some clarification for the universal support. I didn't quite follow what it meant or is or what it does. Yeah, okay. So if you, it's a little, so really I should define it after we calculate the typology, but so let me say, so when we calculate the, if we use the, this, this gen um, defines seven trees. And if we do the whole system definition and make the violation tableau and put it in OT workplace and calculate the typology, it's going to give us, uh, I think it's 14 languages. Um, and it turns out that if you do it with just, if you do the same thing with just these three trees, it gives you this exact same typology with all 14 languages. So that, the universal support is a subset of your inputs that um, it's like that's enough to support support the whole typology. Um, but if we try to take a subset of the trees that doesn't include um, that doesn't include the uniformly right branching one, for example, then we were going to get a smaller typology and it doesn't support the whole system. Does that e explain? Yes, that helps a lot. Thanks. Okay, great. Um, yeah, I just didn't want to uh, build all seven of the trees here with a manual tree builder, but. Okay. So it Any seems more that they, yeah. It seems that they are known, so we can move forward. Right. Okay, sounds good. So uh, that's how it looks like people are able to access this. this that, that's good. Okay, so the step-by-step the -step instructions are on here as well. Um, so that's how you can build those three trees of the universal support in, in the manual tab of the of spot. Um, you can also create them algorithmically instead of manually, and this is going to be quicker. So here I'm going to build show how to build um, all seven trees instead of just the three from the universal support. So uh, still in the input parameters section of Gen, if you just click on the automatic tab, right? So here we were in the manual tab, we're going to the automatic tab. Um, this is the section where you can have spot uh, generate your syntactic trees. So for the syntax parameters box, uh, these defaults are all the ones that we want already for the system. So I'm gonna leave them all as they are. Um, and then the one part of our of our system that's not the default is that we don't want to have the non-branching XPs. So to change the setting for that, I'm going to use this a setting under this visibility to phonology field set. Um, I think I'm I, there's a there's a little bit of a latency problem maybe from the recording. Um, so when I click on this, it should give me some options. Uh, for, oh, there we go, uh, for some different visibility settings. 
Um, and I want to check this first one that says treat non-branching XPs as um, X zeros. So well, that means that this will eliminate all the non-branching XPs out of the CAN set. Um, so this is kind of uh, similar to uh, enforcing minimal binarity um, as a as a highly ranked constraint. All right, so now those are all the settings we need for defining the syntactic structure of these of these trees. And now I just need to specify the um, terminal strings. So this time, uh, since it's going to be very quick, let's include both the three terminal trees. Um, and then also the four terminal trees. So I'm going to put ABC for the three terminal trees. And now I also want to have ones that have four terminals. So I can click add terminal string to get some other options. Um, so A, B, C, D for the second one. And I could put some others like um, X, Y if I wanted to. Or if I, if I leave that blank, then it won't do anything with this empty one. All right, so now I can click generate trees and um, get the seven trees that are, are gen specified. If we didn't check the treat non-branching XPs as X zeros, then we would get a lot more trees. So let's see what happens. So I've unchecked it. And if I click generate trees again, um, now we can see instead of having just two possible uh, three terminal trees, there would be uh, 12 of them and then um, 57 possible four terminal trees. So this is just an analytical simplification so we can have a much smaller candidate set with the input candidate set with seven trees instead. Questions about how to use this uh, automatic gen? We're gonna have some some other, exer the exercises will we'll go into some more details uh, with other things you can do with this as well. So what you just showed is the two ways of creating gen, right? Uh, one is manually creating gen, and the other one is automatically generating gen, right? Is yes, that, the inputs. Yeah, the gen. inputs uh, inputs for gen are, are created like that. So uh, if uh, anybody was confused what was going on right now, uh, uh, there are two tabs, uh, automatic and manual. And we did manual first. And then uh, now we did automatic. So you can manually generate them or automatically generate the input for check. And yeah, then so normally, have, yeah. mm -hmm. normally you would just do uh, one of these, but I just want to demonstrate uh, both options. Right. Uh, so you won't do both, uh, but only one of them. OK. Uh, so uh, Kubuzon sensei uh, Yeah, I have two questions. One concerns the, the relationship. Uh, if you uh, build syntactic structures from three um, elements, A, B, and C, then uh, at the bottom you had two structures, left branching and right branching. But in the left branching structure, yeah, two here. Mm -hmm. um, a, B forms, forms a constituent and C is added. But in this case, there are two subcases. Uh, one is um, A modifies B semantically. Uh, and the other option is A and B form a coordinate structure. Can you make a distinction um, of this of, of this kind? Uh, so I think you could, if you want to include the other non-branching uh, ones, then maybe as like you could have um, uh, the distinction like the distinction between uh, this one and so here B and C form a constituent, but they're in a coordinate structure. Uh -huh. And I, I, maybe this isn't the perfect syntax, but uh, you can see if you include the non-branching ones, then you get a lot more uh, distinctions, um, 12 of them. Um, so I guess six of them will be left branching and six will be right branching. Um, in this case, that distinction wasn't one of the things we were trying to analyze, and it's so you can simplify your candidate set by cutting those out. But if you want that distinction, then you could probably include all of these. Um, don't don't check this uh, this option, and you can get all of them. Um, there's some other settings you could use also if you want to change um, restrict where the heads are, for example. Uh, then you could 
like have here's one with here's a way to get six of them um, if you require the heads to be on the left. Um, but then you can get kind of the coordinate structure type of thing uh, and some other ones as well. Uh huh. I see. Okay. Does that answer? Yeah. Yes. And okay. another question concerns the syntactic category of of uh, constituent. So if A and B form form a constituent, that can be a noun phrase of a verb phrase or adverbial phrase. Uh, can you make a distinction of the kind here? Uh, spot doesn't represent that directly. So, uh, I mean, t it's typical to assume in the syntax prosody mapping that the distinctions between like noun and uh, verb uh, wouldn't be relevant to what type of uh, phrase it's mapped to. If you want to provide more more details like that, then um, you can do it in the with the manual one. Like, so a, a, a common thing is to want to distinguish between like lexical and functional phrases. So we have some support for that. If you, you can annotate them like this uh, to say that it's a functional oh, um, projection. And that's going to be gone over in the, in the, one of the exercises on customizing uh -huh. match, but the, we don't have support for that in the, the automatic, the automatic one. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Thanks for your questions. Um, let me make sure I put them back. Uh, I think it's like this. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I think I'll go on and talk about the how to define the outputs now, unless there's any questions about the inputs. Okay. Um, so we were just defining the inputs. We defined them in two different ways. And now let's talk about the, the output structures. So uh, let's say that uh, for the system MSP, ASP, we want the outputs for, for any given syntactic tree, we want to generate all the prosodic trees with these characteristics. So we want all the possible trees P with ordered leaves, where P, the tree, is rooted in uh, phi. Um, and then the syntactic words in the syntactic in S tree will be mapped to prosodic words in P, that's a default setting. The linear order of the terminals will be preserved, so we're not going to shuffle things. That's also a default. Um, all the non, the terminal nodes will be words, and then all the non-terminals will be fives. Um, and then the child of a non-branching phi cannot be phi, so we want to rule out a vacuous recursion. That, that one always holds in spot. So, to set this up in spot, we can scroll down a little bit to the output parameters section. And here, these we mostly want these defaults. Um, the one that we need to specify uh, different from the default is the, the, P, the tree is rooted in uh, phi. By default, the trees are rooted in the intonational phrase. So if we click on this prosodic categories um, header, then uh, we get these options. Uh, and so we're going to change the one that says root prosodic tree in to say phi. Um, and then for the intermediate nodes and for the, the terminals, uh, we can leave those at their default settings because we want them to intermediate nodes to be phi and the terminals to be words for this system. But if you were studying, for example, if you're studying compound words, maybe you would want to have uh, also allow recursive um, words and or maybe and maybe have uh, the feet as terminals, for example. So those are those are some that's a place where you can change the categories. Um, okay, so that's the outputs. Um, we're gonna see the the list of all the outputs um, at the very end. Uh, we don't see that in the intermediate stage here because there are um, many many of them as we saw before. Okay, so then at this point uh, we've defined the input candidates and the output candidates, so we can move on to talking about the. Um, the constraint set, unless anybody has a question. I don't know if there's, okay, I'm gonna talk about the constraints then. So let's say for our constraint set for MSP ASP, we want these um, constraints here in eight, um, three mapping constraints and three markedness constraints. So let's have match XP to phi or match syntax to prosody for the, for the XP. Um, and then a line left and a line right. Um, I think for time, I'm not going to read all these definitions, but you can read them here. 
um, and they're actually on the interface as well, which I'll show you. Um, so those are the three mapping constraints, and then we'll have three binarity constraints for the markedness section. Um, so this constraint set will avoid the pitfalls of using just match with binarity, as well as the shortcomings of using purely align with binarity that are discussed in the, uh, the paper. Um, so match doesn't distinguish between the left branching and right branching structures. Um, so that's what we call the asymmetry problem. Uh, and then align by itself can't distinguish between the matching and uh, mismatching parses of mixed branching structures. So we call that the ambivalence problem. That's just a kind of a background on why there's both match and align in the same system. So to implement this on, on spot, uh, we're just gonna scroll down some more to where the constraints are. And for each kind of family of constraints, there's a field set can expand. So let's take the match one first. And we want a syntax prosody mapping cons match constraint. And by default, uh, XP is checked. So that's that's all we want. You can see there's some other um, options here that you can get information on um, with the info buttons. Oh, and here, if you click the info button next to the constraint name, then you can get the constraint definition um, and a uh, reference. OK, so that's match. Um, and then we also want the align constraint. So we can open the align wrap section and select these to align constraints. Um, again, we want XP for the category, so that's correct by default. And then we can scroll down to the markedness constraint section and open the binarity one and get the bin min branches and bin max branches. And then under the leaf counting binarity, we want bin max leaf. So this the branch counting says it counts the immediate children of the phi, and then the leaf counting counts uh, how words are contained in the phi at any level. Uh, and again, you can see the definitions um, with these info buttons. OK, so that's, the, um, that's all the constraints that we wanted. Let me scroll down in the handout. So at this point, we've defined the whole system, uh, both the uh, conceptually and on spot. And we can scroll down to the bottom and click the get results button. No, there, there, you can feel free to explore these other constraint sections as well. So if I click the get results button, oh, then now I'm getting a warning um, because we provided the inputs on both the manual and the automatic tab. Um, and I'm going to pick from the drop down menu which tab I want to use. Um, I'll pick the automatic tab, but uh, you could also pick the manual tab. OK, and so now uh, it's going to offer to download the results as a CSV file. And you should, that's a good thing to do if you want to um, analyze things uh, further in OT Workplace. So I'm going to save it. And, and then it will also display on the uh, on the spot interface, like so. Um, so you can see there's about, there's 24 um, prosodic parses for the three terminals. Um, again, the, the parentheses represent phi boundaries and then, well, there's actually no intonational phrases here, so we don't see any curly phrases. Uh, the square brackets up here represent the XP boundaries. Okay, and there's all the violation uh, profiles for each of these candidates. Um, and then if you scroll down, you can see there's, um, I think, 150, uh, 176 uh, parses, parses of the four, four terminal trees. Um, so on spot, the, the each input displays with a separate violation tableau. But when you download the CSV file, they're all collected into, into one. Uh, so you can just open the one file in, in OT Workplace. Um, so say I want to save this for later. I can do that using, you save all these, these settings uh, using the save button. Um, and then you can pick the, the name of the, of the file that you want. I'm going to call it my analysis two. Um, and then suppose that I, I come back um, tomorrow and I want to replicate this analysis. Uh, I come back to the site and it's all blank like this, then I can use the load button 
I can click load and then choose the file that we just downloaded. So that was this one, my analysis two. Um, and then it brings back all the, everything that we had set up. Um, and then I could get the results again. I'm not gonna save it cause I already did, but there it is. Okay, so that's the, that's the gist of how to set up an analysis in Spot. If there's uh, any questions, I can answer them now, or I can also take a couple minutes to uh, show how to open this in OT Workplace, depending on how many questions there are. Yes, uh, Kubodaro-sensei. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I'm wondering if you can add um, a fifth uh, cat prosodic category. You assumed foot prosodic word and two other, uh, you know, prosodic categories. But can you add one or two categories on that? Because you know, different people assume different kind, mm. different number of uh, prosodic categories. Can you make adjustment to that that kind of uh, variant? Analysis. Uh, yeah, so right now we don't have support for that on the interface. We do actually have uh, backend support for changing the changing the prosodic hierarchy, but we haven't we haven't built it onto the interface yet. Uh -huh. um, but that's on the. I'm hoping to add that feature eventually. Um, oh, okay. And if, if somebody wants to do an analysis with a different prosodic hierarchy, I I could um, I can write the I would be happy to help set up an analysis file on the on the back end, but we don't have the the interface support for that right now. Okay, I have another question about um, constraints. Um, mm -hmm. Are the constraints fixed in the program, or can how did you define the the how it, how did you put the definitions of each um, constraint into the program? Uh, yeah, so they're all written in um, JavaScript, and you can see the code uh, for them. See, they are so fixed. They're fixed, yeah. So they're all kind of, you know, they're written in here, and they have various, some of them have different options. Um, so so the, some of these, a lot of the options are, are uh, implemented on here. So some of, so if you use these show more buttons, then you can see different options, like you can customize the match uh, uh, constraints. Um, I think we have the customize align constraint on here too. Yeah, so you can customize these guys. And then uh, like if you wanted to try to only align the, the lexical nodes or only align the maximal nodes or something like that. Uh-huh. So um, and what then, you're supposed to do if you want to change the definition of all the constraints. Yeah, if you want to change, if you want to write your own constraint, then unfortunately that you have to write the JavaScript for it. I but see. we tried to implement, um, we tried to implement all the ones that we'd heard of. Um, there's other, yeah, there's all these other ones down here too, like the um, equal sisters and so on. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks for the question. Yes, uh, so do we have any other uh, <clears throat> question uh, from Shitsumo or Shitsuki Toka or Nihongo de Matai Jobunano de Onegaishimasu? Hango go to Kenchan Smita. So it's okay to ask questions in English, Japanese, or Korean. Yeah, if you have any. So it seems like we started with this uh, uh, spot introduction on what it does, and then there are four major steps uh, that uh, a user need to uh, uh, follow, right? Um, and there are multiple options in there. So details of these options need to be explored by each user, depending on uh, how uh, they want to use it. But um, Compared to what we uh, talked about today, uh, I think uh, the first step is defining the inputs. Mm -hmm. And the second step is uh, defining the outputs. And that's like uh, basically what we do in any OT analysis, right? Uh, we define the inputs and we define the outputs. 
And then the third step is uh, choosing the constraints that uh, you want to use in the system. And that part, you need previous uh, knowledge about the constraints, how these constraints work and uh, in terms of that. And then the last part is um, creating violation tableau or typology using the results. However, it will be done uh, using OT workplace. Is that the correct understanding of the algorithm? Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. So the we could do a really simple one if we just put in some, if you just put in your uh, string of, you just build a very simple tree and then pick a, I don't know, I'll pick a binarity constraint. Then, so the, the spot generates the violation tableau. Um, I think normally when you're doing an OT analysis by hand, then coming up with all these violation counts is a big part of the work because you have to evaluate um, each each input, uh, sorry, each output and see, okay, does it, you know, does it violate each of my constraints? Um, and that part becomes very quick and easy using spot. Um, but the then spot encourages you to uh, be very formal in defining the input set. Um, and that that is uh, maybe a less familiar type of work, um, even though it automates the the evaluation of the constraints. Um, so then after you have the violation tableau, then the rest you can do in OT workplace, uh, figuring out the rankings and seeing the typology that is that is generated. Yeah. So if uh, somebody asks about uh, pros and cons of uh, the spot, uh, do you have uh, some advice like about those features? Pros, I, I think uh, pros, uh, you don't need to say we, because we saw all the pros uh, that it can do, but something maybe uh, not a con, but like a cons, but like something that people need to be aware of, maybe this is not gonna uh, be done. Is there anything that, uh, comes up to your mind uh, other than the ones that you responded for based on the question by Kupson Sensei? Hmm, I think, I mean, I think oftentimes what pe people like to propose uh, a new constraint in there, or, you know, you do some analysis and then you find, oh, the constraint, the existing constraints don't quite cover this case. And then you want to uh, make your own constraint to solve your your pattern um, and spot doesn't really unless, unless you're comfortable writing the javascript then spot doesn't really support that so that's that's probably the main uh limitation is if you're wanting to um, propose a constraint um but hopefully we've if you if you want to uh, kind of explore the um the predictions of the uh existing established constraints then um i think most of them are are here and you are you can always uh, email me or submit an issue on on github if you have another constraint that you would like to see the consequences of um, or if you're comfortable programming in javascript then you can uh, you can write it um, and add it to your local copy i see um, that sounds good. So existing constraints, we can use the system, the built-in system that we have. But uh, if you want to propose, if someone wants to propose a completely new constraint, capturing some other aspects, uh, they would need to uh, contact us or need to have someone who can actually uh, do the JavaScripting uh, that captures uh, the violation profile or can calculate the violation profile of that particular constraint that they're proposing. Right. Sounds yeah. Good. Um, yeah, so yeah. I think, uh, do you have any questions or comments? Maybe not comments, but question. So it seems like <clears throat> we don't have any questions. So uh, Jenny can stop sharing the screen. Okay, or alternately, I can quick, I can very quickly show how to bring it into OT workplace if that's helpful, or we can leave that for tomorrow. Uh, maybe let's uh, do it in the beginning of tomorrow, so, so people don't have too many things yeah. going on. And yeah, so let's thank Jenny for the uh, presentation. Thank you. Yes, and the recording will now start. Uh,